Heavenly Father, I pray that every Christian in this room, every Christian joining us by Zoom, will absolutely be convinced that you love them. And I pray that as we come to grips once again with the love that you have for us, that we'll have some means through the truth of the scripture and the illumination granted by the Holy Spirit, that we would see how great your love truly is. May that encourage us tonight and in the days to come, especially in hard times. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I invite you to open your Bibles with me tonight to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Uh, I think, <clears throat> and this verses 1 and 2 uh, <clears throat> is before us tonight, but verse 1 specifically <clears throat> and I think, <clears throat> I think I'm going to come back here next week if I'm alive. And the Lord grants that I'll come back because there's a whole chunk of this that I'm not going to deal with tonight. I want to save it for next week. Um, but both of these messages will come out of these two verses. First John chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 1 and 2. And I'm reading the New American Standard Bible, the 2020 update, whatever that's worth. Verse 1 of chapter 3 of 1 John, see or behold or take particular notice how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And in fact, we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him, beloved. Now, we are children of God. And it has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. I want to quote several uh, translations and one paraphrase. <clears throat> Uh, from verse one, because I'm I'm focusing on that 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 statement. See how great a love the Father has given us. <clears throat> you might be surprised how many different ways that can be translated. The ESV translates it: See what kind of love. The Geneva Bible, very old translation, uh, doesn't even use the word love. It has, see the inestimable glory of this, that we are children of God. The Amplified <coughs> says, oh, what an incredible quality of love. And I think my favorite is really a paraphrase. <laughs> And it's Phillips, the J.B. Phillips paraphrase. He says, consider the incredible love that the Father has shown to us. And then, by the way, he, he, he completes that verse this way. This explains why the world will no more recognize us than it recognized Christ. Isn't that interesting? Now, an introductory comment. Um, if someone were to ask me this question, for example, in a youth Q&A, Sam, um, what one large piece of advice would you give to help me get my theology straight? Well, first of all, you get your theology from the Bible, but let's set that aside. I would say one of the most important things to get straight theologically 
as you seek to interpret the scripture is, is to rightly interpret the truths and promises of God that relate to the present and those that relate to the future. Now, there are those who say everything's in the present and there is no future. There are those who will say everything's in the future, there is no present. But really, it's important to understand God has some, some truths, some promises He wants you to enjoy right now. Other things He wants you to wait on, right? And you, you have to know and differentiate between what's now and what's, what's in the future. And that certainly uh, really forms an outline of thought here. Now, and, and he emphasizes several times now, uh, I'll look at this again, verse 1, how great a love the Father has given us. That's, that's present, isn't it? That we would be called the children of God. And in fact, we are. So you see the now of that? And verse 2, beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet appeared what we will be. Now we're in the future, right? Are you with me? Hello? Okay. But we will be like him because we will see him as... So you get this feeling of now and, and future. That's really important. Okay. But what is the constant thread that connects now and future in terms of God's promises to his people it is his love tonight i want to talk to you my title is god's incredible love god's incredible love and i take that from the phillips paraphrase consider the incredible love the father has shown to us it is incredible i think we overuse words like awesome that is an awesome pizza Probably a misuse of the word awesome. Awesome belongs to something larger than pizza, although maybe you <laughs> enjoy a pizza to that extent. But I would suggest sometimes hyperbolic language should be reserved for truly remarkable moments, or they really lose their flavor. Now, the word incredible is like that. I think, however, it is a it to call God's love incredible. The NASB says, see how great a love the Father has given to us. Uh, there, and I can't remember now, I didn't write it down, but there's one translation. Instead of the verb given, it, it has the idea of, of effervescent pouring. Um, this whole sense of, I get, you know, you have a, a little trickle of a waterfall in a creek. It's comparing that to Niagara. Have you ever been to Niagara Falls? That's not a creek. This effusive, this, this overflowing, this powerful, explosive uh, amount of water. That's the idea here in how great a love the Father has given to us. I, I think whatever we can come up with to help us think about the, the, the incredible nature of God's love shown to us in Christ. Three things. First, the location of his love. Second, the objects of his love. And third, the accomplishment of his love. And then we'll conclude it. Location of his love, objects of his love, and accomplishment of his love. First, the location of his love. Even though it is not made clear here in these two verses, I feel absolutely comfortable in saying that he is talking about those people who are in Jesus Christ. Where's the location of his love? Now, it's true to say God loves flowers. It's true to say, because doesn't Jesus say God closed the flowers of the field? It's true to say God loves his creation like birds. Jesus said he feeds the birds of the air. He, and if a sparrow falls to the ground, 
the Father knows about. He's concerned about little birds. But it's also true to say he has a special love for those whom he has chosen from the foundation of the world for whom Christ died on the cross. We are especially, uniquely, singularly loved. His love for us can only be described by words like incredible and awesome, eternal, explosive, transforming, and never-ending. This incredible love is for those who are in Christ. Christ is the context in which God's love is seen, experienced, and known. Okay. If you want to know God's love, there's only one place to find it, and that's in Jesus Christ. You'll never know the love of God until you come to Christ. Second, in addition to the location of his love, the objects of his love, who or what, what is or who are the objects of his love? Well, I think it's pretty clear in our text. See if you can pick it up as I read it again. How great, see how great a love the Father has given us. There's a certain group of people referenced here. Who's the definition of us? Well, he, he goes on and says that we should be called the children of God. Look at verse 2. Beloved. Beloved means those who are loved. It's in the plural. So there, this is the us of verse 1. Now verse 2, the group are beloved. And he says in verse 2, we are children of God. So who are these people? These people are the children of God. These people are believers. These people are those whom Christ has, has given his life for our sins. The Father has chosen us. The Holy Spirit has entered into our souls, into our lives to transform us and make us members of God's family. Right? Now, if you're a child of God, are you? Are you a child of God through faith in Christ? The Bible says here that God wants you to know how much he loves you. He wants you to know. He says, see, behold, take notice how great a love. The Father has given to us. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to take things for granted. Do you have a problem like that? You surely don't. I'm the only one in this room that has a problem like that, right? I, you know, something is is in my life, and I'm it's great, and I just don't even think about it. I just take it for granted. I'm used to it. That's a part of life, isn't it? Is it possible that we have? known that God loves us so long that it no longer excites us to hear that God loves us? Did you know there was a time you didn't know the love of God in your life? You're on your own. <laughs> and you scramble, well, the, I don't know, I shouldn't quote this song because, well, there's just probably several reasons why I shouldn't quote the song. I don't even like the genre necessarily. But I heard it one time, and it, it, it struck me. Now, if I quote it and you know it, looking for love in all the wrong places. Yeah. There's something that rings true in that, isn't it? People looking for love in all the wrong places. Thinking they'll find it here. They'll find it there. They'll find it over here. And they never do. Why? Because number one, the location is in Christ. Number two, the objects of his love are those who are in Christ. Whom God has adopted into his family as his children. Who's justified us through the atoning work of Christ. Who's, 
whose hearts have been changed and transformed, who are made new creatures in Jesus Christ by the power of his saving grace and the Holy Spirit. Are you excited yet? Those whom good Jesus is preparing a place for us. And soon, it won't be long, we're getting out of this place. Can I get a witness from somebody? And we're going home. And there's a place with your name on it that he's preparing for you. Why? Because you're the object of his love. God has targeted you. And he didn't ask for permission. He didn't say, would you let me love you? He just loved you. Because you didn't know any difference anyway. And he placed his love upon you. From eternity past to eternity future. And there is nobody, Romans 8, that can take his love away from you. You're the object of his love. Everyone in this world may not love you. Most people may not love you. They may not even understand you. But if you're a child of God, God loves you. Okay, his love in Christ. Object of his love is people. Third, the accomplishment of his love. Notice, notice what his love achieves, accomplishes. Again, verse 1, see how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And in fact, we are. Verse 2, beloved, now we're the children of God. Now we are the children of God. And it does not yet appear what we will be, but we know when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as, as he is. What did God's love accomplish in Christ for his people? He saved us. But what does that mean? It means a number of things, according to our text. It means that he transforms us in salvation from rebels against God to children of God. And didn't Jesus teach us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. We are his children. Adopted into the family of God. Changing our very essence of being and changing who and what we are. This change, however, does have a negative tone to it, according to verse 1. In the moment God, God accomplished that for us, the world ceased to understand us. And Jesus talked about that in the Gospels. He warned the disciples, they will not understand you. They will not like you. They will not agree with you. They will oppose you because they don't like me. And they don't agree with me. And they don't follow me. So wherever Jesus is, we're with him. But that puts us against the world and the world against us. But that's okay. That's okay. You cannot be a Christian and live in such insecurity that you have to have everybody like you. If you're the kind of person that you don't have any peace unless everybody likes you, number one, I feel sorry for you. What was it Abraham Lincoln said? You can please some of the people some of the time, but not all the people all the time. If you're just living your life, get people to like you, you're going to be a miserable bloke or bloquette. Number two, all that matters is that God likes you. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. You know, the world was against Jesus, wasn't it? It didn't matter one lick, did it? Didn't matter one lick. Jesus finished the job, and that's all that matters. Let me tell you, the day is going to come. It not may come, it will come. When the only thing that matters in my life and yours is that God says to us, you're mine. That's it. I don't care about anybody. That's a great accomplishment. And, and I don't want to drive it too far down the road because I want to come back here next week. Remind me to come back next week to this passage. It does yet appear what we will, but we will be what God will make us to be because we're saved. That's his accomplishment great 
Oh, see how great the love of God is in Christ to his people to accomplish these great things. Application and final thought. If I really understand that God loves me this much, it should do several things to me and to you. Number one, it should humble you. It should humble you. Here's, here's what I mean. You should not feel like you're somebody, like you're exalted because God loves you. Because let me tell you something. God doesn't love you because you were lovable. God loves you in spite of the fact you were unlovable. God doesn't love you because you're obedient. God loved you in spite of the fact you were disobedient. So there was nothing in me that made God love me except God wanted to love me. That humbles me. I feel honored. Right? You ought to feel humble and grateful. But second, it lifts me up in the right kind of way. When I'm, when I'm groveling in the dust, as I frequently do, there used to be a band, some of you may remember, called the Moody Blues. Boy, that's my middle name. I'm moody and I'm blue most of the time. Now, quit poking each other with your elbows. Talking about you. I'll tell you what will lift you up. To remember God loves you. To the degree he loves you. In the way he loves you. It'll lift you up. It'll inspire you. It'll also strengthen you. I love that passage in 2 Corinthians 12 where God said to Paul, you don't need weaknesses removed in your life. You need my grace actualized in your life to turn your weakness into power. God doesn't want to take away my weakness. He wants to strengthen me in the very place I'm weak. A lot We could talk a lot about that. It should strengthen me. God loves me. And one other thing it should do in my life, ooh, this is hard, but it, I got to say it. It'll make me love others, especially those I don't love. <laughs> yeah. Do you have people in your life that you don't like? No names. I love committees. God has a way of putting people on committees who don't like each other. It's so sweet to watch that happen. It's called heavenly sandpaper. God wants us to love one another. Why? Because He loves us. Well, I heartily recommend the love of God to you. And I'll say again, you will not find love anywhere else in this world except in God himself. You want to be loved? You come to Jesus. You're going to be loved like you never thought you could be loved before. And you will know his love in a way you never imagined you could experience love. And it'll fill your soul. And it'll fill your life. And it'll give you satisfaction and contentment and joy and peace. Oh, the incredible love of God. Let us pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to show us your nature and to express your love, especially on the cross. We remember the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 5, 8, where he said, God demonstrated his love toward us. And that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you for loving us to that extent. We pray that we will never get over your love. That we will rejoice in it. We'll be inspired by it. We'll be lifted by it. We'll be motivated by it. And we'll be guided by it. Thank you for loving us. Help us to love you more. In Jesus' name we pray.